good morning or good afternoon or good evening depending on where in the world you are watching us my name is paul lobach and i'm the director of the drug registration and listing staff here at the fda i have the pleasure of welcoming you to this webinar and leading off this day of presentations as in past years i like to emphasize the importance of the registration and listing process and its data and this year is no exception with the pandemic and the national health emergency, FDA's registration and listing data has become more important than ever. So today through this presentation, I will hope you will be able to identify at least one use of the registration and listing data by FDA during the national health emergency identify potential problems encountered by FDA when registration and listing data is missing or inaccurate. And I hope that, uh, that you'll be able to recognize and prevent situations of compliance issues. So before I begin, let me, let me remind you of where we were earlier this year. On January 31st of this year, the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency in response to COVID-19. Then, on March 13th, the President declared the coronavirus outbreak a national emergency, effective back to March 1st, 2020. Also on March 13th, just happened to be the day that the Durla staff began 100% telework. And then later in March, the FDA published three separate guidances, all related to alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So what happened next? Let's begin with the number of new registrations. As you can see, January and February established a pretty normal pace compared to previous years. Then in March, the national emergency was declared and the numbers spiked at the end of the month. The surge continued all the way through April and May and has slowly come down since. Similarly, January and February established a pretty normal pace for new labeler code requests. Again, though, we see the surge begin in March watching us. My name is Paul Lobach, and I'm the director of the drug registration and listing staff here at the FDA. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this webinar and this new labeler and containers. These templates either additional active ingredients were left out or they didn't bother to modify the strength from the default value of 80%. Sometimes we'd even find that inactive ingredients were left out from the original three in the template, such as fragrances, dyes, and gel polymers. Now, within the registrations, we found trouble with invalid email addresses and invalid phone numbers. Sometimes there were valid DUNS and email or phone numbers for companies, but the companies didn't have any affiliation with the foreign establishment. And we even, we've even seen the use of virtual offices, such as residences, storage facilities, and other non-traditional business locations where the named US agent supposedly resided, but doesn't really operate. So, now that we've scrutinized the data, let's see how the data has been used. We'll start with the do not use list. Some of you may have seen this. This is a screenshot from the FDA webpage warning consumers about certain hand sanitizer products. When methanol was discovered in several hand sanitizer products, Registration and listing submissions were analyzed to determine the manufacturers of those products, the NDC numbers and product names of other alcohol-based hand sanitizers manufactured at the same facility, the U.S. agent and other contact information for the firm, as well as the distributors and identification of the labels of those products. But our efforts were hampered. 
There was incorrect or missing manufacturer information. There were incorrect assignment of NDCs. Product names remain just hand sanitizer, despite what it said on the label. Distributors had to be identified by review of individ individual JPEG files. And some foreign manufacturers simply identified their U.S. customer as the U.S. agent, or perhaps even the SPL consultant as the U.S. agent, just to fill in the value. There were also investigations. Many of you may have seen this article from the Wall Street Journal about a single company linked to a house in Delaware that had registered more than 1,300 firms. Now, the article was, those were all device firms, but the Durlis data was searched and analyzed for the presence of that same company, the name, the address, or email identified in the Wall Street Journal article. We also searched for the presence of any affiliate companies, and we also searched for patterns of any U.S. agent or email address or phone number appearing in an unusual number of files. Now, various investigations and other analysis shows that some company's information is being used or referenced as contact information or as the U.S. agent without their knowledge. So how can you find out if your information is being used? Download the Decker's file. That's the Drug Establishment Current Registration file. And search for your company name and info. And I'll give you a little teaser. We have a presentation about that later today. So look for that when it comes by. So hopefully not too many of you are familiar with the deficiency letter template that's on the right side of the slide. As you probably know, however, though, the Durla staff conducts its own review of hand sanitizer listings in addition to all the consults from other offices investigations. The listing data is compared to the submitted labeling and other evidence presented. For example, the photo of the tested sample. And as you'd expect, we are seeing all kinds of errors. Incorrect marketing category, incorrect strength, incorrect ingredient list, incorrect dosage form, missing package presentations, incorrect in NDC assignment, and of course, inadequate drug facts labeling, as we saw earlier. Registration and listing has even been used within emergency use authorizations or EUAs. As most of you know, many drugs and vaccines have been granted EUAs, usually as a part of a phase three trial prior to approval. Now, normally, phase three trials are exempt from registration and listing, but adding the registration and listing as a part of the emergency use authorization agreement facilitates the importation of that product from other countries and provides FDA the greater surveillance, tracking, and recall ability that it needs. Now, let's take a look at what's to come. The influx of all the new companies and all their registration, listing, and labeler code requests raises questions and necessitates certain Sometimes we'd even find that inactive ingredients were left out from the original three in the template, such as fragrances, dyes, and gel polymers. Now, within the registrations, we found trouble with invalid email addresses and invalid phone numbers. Sometimes there were valid DUNs and email or phone numbers for companies, but the companies didn't have any affiliation with the foreign establishment. And we even, we've even seen the use of virtual offices, such as residences, storage facilities, and other non-traditional business locations where the named U.S. agent supposedly resided but doesn't really operate. So, now that we've scrutinized the data, let's see how the data has been used. We'll start with the do not use list. 
Some of you may have seen this. This is a screenshot from the FDA webpage warning consumers about certain hand sanitizer products. When methanol was discovered in several hand sanitizer products, registration and listing submissions were analyzed to determine the manufacturers of those products, the NDC numbers and product names of other alcohol-based hand sanitizers manufactured at the same facility. The U.S. agent and other contact information for the firm, as well as the distributors and identification of the labels of those products. But our efforts were hampered. There was incorrect or missing manufacturer information. There were incorrect assignment of NDCs. Product names remain just hand sanitizer, despite what it said on the label. Distributors had to be identified by review of individ individual JPEG files. And some foreign manufacturers simply identified their U.S. customer as the U.S. agent, or perhaps even the SPL consultant as the U.S. agent, just to fill in the value. There were also investigations. Many of you may have seen this article from the Wall Street Journal about a single company linked to a house in Delaware that had registered more than 1,300 firms. Now, the article was, those were all device firms, but the Durless data was searched and analyzed for the presence of that same company, the name, the address, or email identified in the Wall Street Journal article. We also searched for the presence of any affiliate companies, and we also searched for patterns of any U.S. agent or email address or phone number appearing in an unusual number of files. Now, various investigations and other analysis shows that some company's information is being used or referenced as contact information or as the U.S. agent without their knowledge. So how can you find out if your information is being used? Download the Decker's file. That's the Drug Establishment Current Registration file. And search for your company name and info. And I'll give you a little teaser. We have a presentation about that later today. So look for that when it comes by. So hopefully not too many of you are familiar with the deficiency letter template that's on the right side of the slide. As you probably know, however, though, the Durla staff conducts its own review of hand sanitizer listings in addition to all the consults from other offices' investigations. The listing data is compared to the submitted labeling and other evidence presented. For example, the photo of the tested sample. And as, and, as you'd expect, we are seeing all kinds of errors. Incorrect marketing category, incorrect strength, incorrect ingredient list, incorrect dosage form, missing package presentations, incorrect in NDC assignment, and of course, inadequate drug facts labeling, as we saw earlier. Registration and listing has even been used within emergency use authorizations, or EUAs. As most of you know, many drugs and vaccines have been granted EUAs, usually as a part of a phase three trial prior to approval. Now, normally, phase three trials are exempt from registration and listing, but adding the registration and listing as a part of the emergency use authorization agreement facilitates the importation of that product from other countries and provides FDA the greater surveillance, tracking, and recall ability that it needs. Now, let's take a look at what's to come. The influx of all the new companies and all their registration, listing, and labeler code requests raises questions and necessitates certain actions which will dominate our efforts in the coming months. First of all, more registered firms means more requests for assistance. Therefore, in order to help companies help themselves, we have newly revised web pages available on the Durless website. Our two listing templates for hand sanitizer were not only popular, they saved us an enormous amount of time and effort providing support and getting the data we needed. So 
With that success, new templates are being considered for other types of drugs that are commonly listed. As you would expect, all the data issues we've encountered during this surge of new records has already led to an increased number of compliance cases. We also expect this coming January an increase in the number of inactivations as a lot of these companies choose not to renew their registration and let their listings go uncertified. Please don't do this. If you know your company will not be renewing its registration, please specifically deregister and delist your products. All the problems with the contact information in the US agent data has already led to increased scrutiny and validations of registrations and labeler code requests. FDA has always collaborated and will continue to collaborate with Dun & Bradstreet when it encounters problematic Dun's records. FDA is considering other avenues of action against the submission of false U.S. agent data. And even though it is trending downward, FDA expects to have burned through as much as 9 to 10 years worth of available unused labeler codes by the end of the year. Consequently, the FDA will need to find ways to address the issue of available five-digit labeler codes moving forward. And so, to conclude, I'm going to bang my drum one more time to get the message across that registration and listing plays a fundamental role for FDA in our mission to protect and promote the public health. Bad data, incomplete or inaccurate information not only hampers the FDA, it can endanger consumers. And so for those of you who are uh, taking this for uh, continuing edu education credits, let's go to our challenge questions. Which of the following uses of registration and listing data has not yet been employed this year as a result of the pandemic? We have compliance investigations, B, recalls of products containing methanol, hurricane response, or vaccine importation. And if you chose C, you were correct. Challenge question number two. Which of the following statements about quality and accuracy of the Durlis data is not true? A, incorrect manufacturer and lack of API manufacturer hampered efforts to track the source of methanol contamination. B, no specific product name, for example, proprietary name equals hand sanitizer, made it difficult to search records in the database. C, invalid contact information and U.S. agent data delayed or obstructed communications with firms. Or D, Using different NDC product codes for differences only in package size created confusion among consumers. The answer is D. While using different NDC product codes for differences only in package size is, is bad form and not recommended uh, for NDC assignments, uh, we, saw, we so far haven't seen any uh, confusion this has caused among consumers. Challenge question three. What's the quickest way to see if a foreign manufacturer is using your data as a contact or a U.S. agent? A, you can hire a private investigator. B, download the Decker's file and search for your company's information. Or C, inform FDA when in receipt of a regulatory communication for a company that you don't represent. And the answer is B. While you should also do C, if you, uh, you should inform the FDA when in receipt of a letter from us about a company that you don't represent. But B is something that you can do right now. Download the Decker's file and search for your company's info and see who's referencing it. So finally, this slide is as much a, a call to action as it is a thank you. The Durlis staff believes, as the saying goes, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. 
We believe it's worth our time and yours to present all the information you will receive today so that you can give us the information we need on the first try and without error. So, thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend this SBIA eDuralist webinar. And thank you for taking the time to ensure that your submissions are, com are complete and accurate. This concludes my presentation, and I would now like to pass the ball here to Don and Pui to present about labeler codes.